morning and blessed Epiphany Tide. Today is Friday, February 3rd, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. This morning is the second episode of a special series I'm calling Free Text First Fridays where every first Friday of the month we take a break from whatever book we're working through to talk about a special subject of interest. If you're looking forward to the end of Haman's very bad day from Esther, well, you'll have to wait until Monday. But before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, who contributes toward bringing you Thy Strong Word. Learn more about them at lhfmissions.org. Now, Today's topic is one that's very dear to my heart, although that might sound odd, because we're talking about funerals and funeral texts. Why would that be so dear to me as a pastor? Well, for the simple reason that much of what we do in the church is oriented toward this very thing, the moment when God decides to take us from this veil of tears unto himself. Christian funerals are a time of rightfully mourning the loss of those we love, but also encouraging one another in view of God's promise of the resurrection and the new heavens and the new earth. So joining me to explore a few select funeral texts is my guest, the Reverend Jen Daub, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock, North Carolina. Pastor Daub, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much, Pastor Boo. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing as well as I can be. Uh, brother, you know, you, I understand, are celebrating an anniversary today of sorts. Uh, isn't that right? Something about 21? That is correct. I am not 21 years old. That oh, was several okay. years ago. <laughs> but today is the uh, 21st anniversary of my installation here at St. Paul. That's it. Wow. 21 years at one parish, which is you know, which is really uh, an amazing thing to hear, and here's why. Because we do know that there is some benefit in pastors moving around. You know, sometimes people grow maybe uh, too, too many roots, and they, and they can't hardly see their effectiveness because perhaps they've done all that they can do in an area. On the other hand, moving around too frequently causes a little bit of disruption. There's no stability. There's always a few years, every few years, of getting used to a new pastor and his visions. And so the stability that that life, not life, but but long term pastors bring is 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 excellent. So I congratulations on twenty one years at your current parish. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, in your over two decades of pastoral ministry, how many funerals would you say that you have officiated? Oh my goodness, I think I've lost count. Um, mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. has been been a lot. Um, you know, it's not just uh, some of my members, but I've I've also helped out uh, one of the local funeral homes on some of theirs. I I come from a funeral family. My dad's been a funeral director for 58 years, and you know, so it's always I have uh, empathy for the funeral homes when they're looking for clergy to help, and so that's been an opportunity for me to you know meet families at their time, but most importantly to proclaim Christ crucified and and the the joy of the gospel and even if there haven't been members they still get the Lutheran service right and they get Jesus and sometimes that's the the most glorious thing that as a preacher I can do is give them comfort and hope and and joy even in a sad time like this well said you know I grew up in a different church body down south I mentioned it you know maybe when I first came on the air I mentioned it quite a bit so that people could get to know me but I can tell you that from some of the traditions and some of the funerals that I have attended growing up, a lot of times, especially if the faith of the person was either dubious or unknown, the preacher seemed to be trying to preach the guy out of the grave, trying to preach him into heaven after he had passed, as opposed to yeah. the comfort that I find in the Lutheran service book. So someone might say, well, how can you do a Lutheran funeral for someone who is only nominally or maybe isn't at all Lutheran? And you answered the question right there. You know, it's not about telling fibs or comforting lies to family to make them feel better. It is about proclaiming the truth of the gospel to the living. And so even in cases where a person was an unbeliever, um, I've agreed to do those funerals, except with the caveat 
that I'm not going to preach them into heaven. I'm not going to pretend what is not true is true. Instead, we're just going to focus on Jesus. And that gives an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Um, and, of course, right there in the box or the urn or in the grave is the law. Exactly. And I, and I think that's something that sometimes folks forget is it, my wife always says no one's a jerk once they're dead. You know, everyone's always perfect. They've always lived a perfect life. And and I've al already asked my Bible class, I say, well, you know, when when it's time for the Lord to receive me home, please let someone stand up there and say he was a jerk, but he was a jerk forgiven by Jesus, because ultimately that's what it's about. It's about that Christ has died for us. We preach Christ crucified. And and I think, you know, some people, we they don't like to talk about funerals. They don't like to talk about what the end may be. But that's the opportunity for us, even in death. Our our funeral service is the opportunity to bring the 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 joy that we have as Easter Christians to light, especially to others who may come and and never um, may not be churchgoers, but can have the the hope that we have after a service that so many others don't have in their services. Oh, I could not agree more. Now, you have uh, some more years in ministry than I do, just about one decade more. I'm about tw what, 13 years now in ministry, but I will say that the first year, for actually first year and a half of ministry, and my very first call was notable to me because I had about 25 funerals from my one parish, and it was very uh, impactful and formative to me in my future ministry. Uh, since then, I have taken quite an interest in this topic, which is why I mentioned at the top of the show that this is something that I'm very interested in. I've served as a hospice chaplain, um, and of course, we all serve as hospice chaplains in one way or the other with our own members. But I found it fascinating as a hospice chaplain working for just a, a secular hospital program that uh, so many people find themselves at the the end of their journey, and there are so many different reactions. There's there's fear. There's hope. There's um, there's just you know the anxieties, and it's amazing how when you have that opportunity to point them to Christ, even if let's say they're a, a fervent unbeliever, we find obviously a huge receptive receptivity at that point because the law has worked on the heart of the person in ways that even the best uh, uh, preaching could never do. When you're finally faced with that reality, and so. You know, what an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. And and we as Christians shouldn't look back and say, well, that's not fair because I've been a Christian my whole life. Well, what does that matter, right? We, this is an opportunity to bring people in for Christ. And so uh, I think so much of what we do, Pastor Dobb, is related to death, the wages of sin. And, and not that we should look forward to it by any stretch of the imagination because it's always bad, but isn't that what we're in the business of, is uh, proclaiming hope to those who are facing the end. Absolutely. And I think that's also brings the point that, you know, for us as Christians, do we grieve? Absolutely, we grieve. But as, you know, St. Paul reminds us, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. That the joy that, that we have is that the, the grave is never our final resting place. It, it is but our temporary because we know that just as Christ has risen from the dead, we too will rise from the dead. And so while, yes, there's sadness and, and, and grief and, and things, we, we know the, the grave is never our end. It's just temporary. And, and with that in mind, that just gives us such great promise and, and such great hope. And I, you know, I, I know sometimes people, are, they, they just get, oh, we don't want to talk, but what great joy that is for us to, to look forward to, to, um, to being able to see Jesus face to face. And, and I think that's the, the comfort for us every day that we get to live. I think that's a good thought for us to sort of end this little section on our introduction, because I don't want to be remiss in not including prayer before we really dig into the topic. Brother, would you lead us in prayer? 
Sure. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gifts you give and the blessings you pour out. And especially in this uh, time of uh, study, help us uh, focus our minds and our hearts upon your word and help us look for that day when we get to uh, be received into glory to be with you and all of the, the saints and the angels and the entire company of heaven singing in that unending hymn of praise to our triune God. Guard us, guide us, and keep us. This we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> you have worked, I'm sure, with people who are planning their weddings because you you have premarital counseling. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Here in Minnesota, we recommend, uh, well, actually the state recommends 12 hours of premarital counseling, and you get a little discount on your marriage license if you get that done by a pastor or a therapist. But uh, so we that's usually about what I do is 12 hours. But what I've always found interesting is that those who are preparing for marriage will spend sometimes a year or more planning their wedding. And then when it comes time for a funeral, people often leave it up to their kids to plan a funeral in three or four days in one of the hardest times they've ever had in their life. So I think, would you agree, and I'm sure you would, I'll, I'll just go ahead and put that on the table, that Christians really need to be thinking about their even their own funerals well in advance. Think about what we want to communicate with them. Hey, absolutely. And and one of the things we've done here and and we're looking at redoing it again now that we're kind of, you know, can do more post COVID and and things is we we did a whole seminar that was entitled No Before You Go and brought in different planners and, and things. And, and one of the things I had is a, a whole kind of group of sheets that you filled out that um, not only gave information about history and family history and activities, but then it also focused on what are some of your favorite Bible passages and why? What are some of your favorite hymns and why? And I, I gave a whole list of hymns and Bible verses and things, and and it gave people opportunity to lay out a lot of the things that they would like. And some of my easiest funerals that have been done, not just for the family, but also here for me and, and the church office, are the ones that people have had everything written out. And, and in those ones, it's the ones that always really you know, focus on the passages that meant the most to the person and the ones that always bring kind of the most glory uh, in there so that it's not, well, we need to sing, you know, um, stairway to heaven or something like that. It, it's, right. you know, having those beautiful passages that, that look forward. And, and so I think it's important for us to, to talk, you know, about which passages do we like? Uh, preachers are seven trick ponies when it comes to weddings and funerals. There's like seven passages we always like, we always go to. And, you know, so, but sometimes, you know, I've preached on confirmation texts. And so if someone tells me this was my confirmation passage, I, I've used it as their funeral passage. And, but if I don't know, or if the, the kids don't know, um, you know, so that's why I think it's good to talk about it and, and write it down and, and have that for the family to know. Well, now, first of all, I love the title, No Before You Go. I don't know if you came up with that or what, but I'm getting ready to lead some workshops here at my own congregation, similar to what you were saying. Um, I do believe it's now going to be called No Before You Go. I love that. Steal it. That that's fine. I, I have <laughs> I have no uh I have no ownership. I made it up, but you know, take it. I There's love no it. problem. Good. Well, uh, I was thinking preparing for departure with like a, a airline theme, but I know I like no before you go even better. Well, I tell you what, let's do like a really super fast mini version of that workshop. Maybe take us through the key elements of what a funeral service is, because if you're Lutheran, um, then maybe, you know, or maybe you've never been to a funeral or if you're not Lutheran and you happen to be listening and you, you're not familiar with what our funerals look like or why we do what we do, it might be good for us to let people know, you know, what's in them. What, how is it different than a regular worship service or is it different? Why don't you take us through those different elements? Well, I think some of the things that we look at, you know, obviously, if, if you have a casket there, that's a little bit different than a Sunday morning. Um, but really, a lot of the elements of the funeral service are, are very similar to some of the, the Sunday morning things. We, we have hymns, we have readings, prayers, the sermon. Um, you know, some of the things you, you probably won't see a lot in a Lutheran service is 
um, you know, folks getting up and talking about how good, you know, so-and-so was and all the wonderful things they did or, um, you know, reading of, um, I know a lot of folks who have like the reading of the eulogy or, or things like that. You know, I encourage families, you know, do that kind of stuff, but use that in times of like right before the dinner or things. Because ultimately the the service is the opportunity to to really focus our our minds and our eyes and our hearts upon the cross, upon the the empty tomb. Um, it's it's not about how good the person was. It's not about the wonderful deeds they they have done. Because in the end, as you said before, the wages of sin is death. The law is right before us. But we have the the joy of knowing Christ is victorious over death. And Christ has has rescued us from death by his resurrection. So we always look forward to the resurrection, even in our services. And, and I think that's what sets us apart for, as Lutheran Christians from some of the other services. And I've been to a whole slew of other services. And so many, you just leave with that empty feeling like, okay, that was nice, but, and, and for us, we can leave with hope. We can leave with joy. And I think ultimately when planning our service is always having the cross at the center because that gives us the joy, even in a time of sadness. At my wife's mother's funeral, um, she had passed away fairly young in her 50s. And at this funeral, which was a Church of God, uh, which is Pentecostal essentially, a service, the pastor sermon was basically, if you want to see Donna again, you need to get up and give your heart to Jesus now. And it just added law Ooh. upon law. And what a you know, so it's not as though we're being picky or we're saying, well, we want to be faithful to our liturgical heritage. What we're saying is this is an opportunity where the law is already evident and you, you'll never be more – people will never be more receptive to the gospel, and they're never probably more in need of the comfort that God's word and promise brings. Why ruin it with, with you know, talking about the deceased or talking about things that, that don't point to that comfort. And another illustration I would have from my own experience is when I was uh, a vicar, uh, my my uh, supervisor, who was a, is a very conservative pastor, uh, an extremely confessional guy, very good guy, he, he sort of broke his rule and let someone speak during a funeral, and they went on and on and on about how, you know, Joe's looking down from heaven and He's probably playing pranks on Jesus and just, I mean, it was so bad and it just wasn't yeah. proper. And maybe those thoughts gave that person comfort as she remembered her, her, her loved one and all of his pranksterness and all this other kind of stuff, but it just wasn't the right time or place. Yeah, exactly. I, I think probably I, I've said it in Bible class before, I, I think one of the worst things we could ever teach our kids is that so-and-so is looking down from heaven and watching and you know all that may sound like a nice platitude and comfort you know grandma doesn't really care about us anymore because grandma's with jesus and you know there and, and i think that's the comfort that we get to to have is um you know of having having that joy of knowing that they are now in a place where there is no more hardship no more sorrow no more pain Every tear has been wiped away from their eye, and and that's the 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 great joy for us. And I think even as a preacher, from like this year, from Thanksgiving to the second of five funerals, and and someone said, "Well, that's pretty exhausting," and 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 it was, but it was still the opportunity to preach the message of joy in Jesus because of the resurrection. And so that, you know, while emotionally exhausting for the preacher, is still the, the hope that we have because of Christ. I don't know if I should let people in on the secret, and maybe it's not universal, but most pastors I know would readily admit that they would rather do 10 funerals than one wedding. And it's not about the loss of the people, of course, and it's not that we don't find weddings joyful, but when it comes to wanting to share the gospel of Christ to people who are actually listening and, and eager to receive it, or you want to be there in someone's time of need, you can't 
you cannot, you know, you cannot uh, compare a wedding when generally everybody's kind of not listening. They're just waiting for the reception to a funeral where we're confronted with not only the death and loss of our loved one, but our own mortality. And, and we are reminded in a world that wants to deny and ignore death that we need salvation and that salvation has come through yeah. Christ. And so I'd like to uh, go ahead and get into some text. And the first text that you gave us to look at today is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through the first half of verse 5, verse 18 through the first half of 19 and 25. And I'm just going to read that just as you've given it, and then we'll dive into it. This will be from the English Standard Version. But now, thus says Yahweh, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. All right, that's all that text that we just quoted there. Um, the very first verse begins, do not fear. Isn't that the message we need at these times? Absolutely. And and I think that is why this is this is one of my favorite texts to use, not only with the, the commendation of the dying, um, but also with a funeral text. And and this is probably one of the, the ones this that is in the top running for when it is time for my funeral, you know, the passages that I like. But it, right away, the Lord sets the the passage, you know, sets the the um the entire kind of the tenor for the whole whole passage what he's here with those those first words fear not and and it's interesting you know it it talks about why do we not have to fear um, because he says i have redeemed you i have called you by name and you are mine and it, and it's kind of interesting the hebrew in there is is really that the english translation is maybe not as best as it could be um, is that is I I am redeeming you I I have called you mine you are, and it really puts it back on the emphasis of to whom do we belong? Who is the one um, that has done the re redeeming? The Lord has. So why do we need to fear? Not fear, because we belong to the Lord. We don't belong to the world. We belong to the Lord, and and that just that emphasis right there of from the very beginning, don't fear. And and uh, then as I'll, you look I'll, then into oh, pardon the, you know, me, oh, hold on, I want to interrupt you there for Go just ahead. a second because I want I want to I want to illustrate what you said here. So he says, "Fear not," which is so important, and for I have redeemed you, I have called you, and and in the way the ESV translates it, as you point out it really points back to Exodus, right? Like I redeemed you from Exodus. But the sentiment is not just that I'll remember that one time I redeemed you, but rather I'm the one you ha who has redeemed you and continues to redeem you. And now we have a relationship as redeemed and redeemer. It's ongoing. I just didn't want people to miss your point there because that's so important. This isn't just like, talking to the people of old and saying, remember Egypt, this is continuing into the future, into the new Israel, which is us. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I always tell Bible class, I give them the answers before I give them the questions. And, and 19 verse 19 is that key verse that ties back to verse one, but I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait till we, till we get there. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it, 
you know, it's that it's not just um, not just a one and done, but it, it's that that connection uh, with the with the Lord. And and then, he, you know, then in verse two, um, verse two, verse three, um, well, verse two, where it talks about the, you know, passing through the waters, passing through the fire, um, going through the rivers. This is rich imagery here. You know, not just thinking back to passing through the Red Sea, passing through Jordan. Um, you know, we we look about like the the imagery of fire um, recalls us of of how the 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 anger of the Lord. You know, like when in in Hebrew the the translation when the Lord is angry, his nose burns. Um, so so fire often will be used, kind of talking about the. the the destruction, Lord's Lord's anger, but you know this is more than just the the physical um, in there. Um, but here is the the kind of the, for us application today of looking at all of the things that we face every day, all of the everyday calamities, the struggles, the trials, the the the, the pains. Not just a, a flood, not just a, a fire or, or a tornado or, or whatnot. It's no matter what you go through in life, that is the struggle, the, the things, all of those things, notice what it says, verse two, I will be with you. And, and why? Because we are redeemed. Why? Because mine, we are. The, the, the Lord saying, you are mine. We belong to him. So no matter what you face, you are still mine. No matter what you go through, you are still mine. And, and I think that is, again, why is this such a good, um, a, a good funeral passage? Because the fact that here, no matter what that person who has, who has passed away, what, whatever they experienced, the Lord was still with them. The Lord never forgot about them. The Lord always was by their side. And even for those in the church or the funeral home chapel or at the graveside, the Lord is still by their side and they don't have to fear. They don't have to worry. And, and what a beautiful picture that is for us. That is a beautiful picture. You know, no matter the strength of our faith, or even if our faith has been challenged over the years, once you come to the end and you're facing that, that door through which, you know, at some point you're going to have to walk, there is going to be a fear. And even by the most resilient Christian who has relied on their faith and continues to, you know, even if you know where you're going, there is this anxiety, this worry of what will it feel like? What will it be like? What will happen? And so even if you know what's at the end of the journey, that journey through can still be very anxiety inducing. And so what comfort we get from knowing, just as Pastor Dobbs says here, that the Lord stands by us, not only in the past, but even at our worst moments, and then when he's brought us through that door or brought our loved ones through that door, he then stands by those who grieve and mourn. Folks, oh, I want you to take comfort in that verse as we just take a few moments now for a mess, our messages. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Pastor Adab and I will continue talking about funeral and funeral texts right here on Thy Strong Word. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boom. 
And with me today is the Reverend Jim Dobb, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock, North Carolina. Before we jump back into the text, I want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments about today's show, feel free to direct them to me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook. I'm happy to receive your comments or answer your questions on or off the air. Uh, now, Pastor, before the break, we were just sort of uh, getting moving our way through uh, Isaiah 43 and the comfort it brings us, especially in the times where we find ourselves afraid, either at our own death or at the death of loved ones. Um, but let's keep moving because there's a couple more passages we want to get through. So moving through Isaiah 43... Um, I find verse 3 kind of interesting, for I am Yahweh your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, and then it does mention Egypt specifically as a ransom, and Cush and Siba in exchange. Um, you know, that might be a little easier to connect to if you are an Israelite. How do we apply that to our lives today? Well, I think one of the, the ways that we look at this, and, and you can, there's a a great phrase called the kinsman redeemer. And and we look at this kind of going back even into to the book of numbers, where if you had, if say you were uh, a landowner and you, you went broke and, and you had to be expelled from that land, but you had a, another relative who could buy out that land for you to pay off your debt. And then they could buy that land and give it back to you. Or say you went out, um, you, you had to be expelled from that, your property, but then you became off the debt. And, and here, this is kind of this looking forward to the, to the redeeming as we had from verse one, um, the, the idea of that, that someone was given as the, the price to pay the debt for the people. And so here we, we're seeing already kind of the, the foreshadowing, the, the looking, looking towards Jesus as the, the one who will pay our debt for us. So, so here is the one uh, that, that is given on our behalf. And, and why is it? Because in verse 4, we are precious to the, in the eyes of the Lord. We are honored to the Lord that he loves us. And, and I think, you know, again, beautiful richness in this text that, that here we have the opportunity um, that, that even in the midst of, of sadness, we know that redemption was given to us, that it wasn't about our works. It wasn't about what we did to pay off our debt, that someone was given in exchange for us because we are so precious in the eyes of the Lord. And then he ends at this little section here, fear not for I am with you. Again, reminding us that the Lord doesn't leave our side. Sin, death, and the devil are destroyed because what Christ has done for us. So you bring up the, the phrase kinsman redeemer. We learned about that not too long ago right here on this program when we were covering the book of Ruth just a, a couple weeks ago. And so we learned about Boaz being a kinsman redeemer to the family of Elimelech and Naomi's uh, former husband and how he uh, redeems them from uh, their, their situation. And it connects us to Christ. So, yeah, we definitely see it's interesting to see that popping up again, because, you know, if you just read Ruth, you go, oh, OK, kinsman redeemer is this very technical kind of Leverite marriage adjacent situation. But no, all of that was established by God so that we could better connect to the reality that we will be redeemed from our debts that we cannot pay, of course, through Christ. Then we skip down to verses 18 and 19. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. So we shouldn't remember the past? Because every funeral I've been to, that's, what a, that's a lot of what's going on, is people remembering the past. Surely that's not what that means. Well, that that's always the fun game. Do you remember game? This ties back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, the the fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. The it wasn't just the redemption one time, the exodus one time. It's the continual. You you have been redeemed. You are mine. And so, the Israelites were really good at remembering just the past. 
just focusing on the past. And and is it bad to, to remember the past? Absolutely not. But they were focused so much on just the past, but they didn't see what, what the Lord was doing right here, right now, what the Lord had the potential to keep doing for them in the future. And so here the Lord's rem reminding them, don't just stay focused on the past. There is something big that I am going to be doing and, and will do for you. And, and I think that's always the good reminder for us. You know, again, there are some folks who believe that once you die, you die. That's it. Nothing more. The, the grave is the, the end. There's nothing beyond this world. And, and what a sad way to think. If this world is all that there is, stop the ride. I want to get off. Because if all I have to look forward to is, is sickness and hardship and pain and, and awful, oh, that's, that's awful. But if I get to look forward to something new, oh, man, that, that's so much better. And I think that's the great joy that what we're reminded in this text is don't just stay focused on the past, but look forward to what the, the things that I'm going to be doing. 100% agree with you. It sort of connects back to this idea of I'm not just the one who has redeemed you, but I am continuing to redeem you. So if all you're focused on is the past, then you're, you're missing what I'm doing in the present. Right. How what a powerful message from well from God through Isaiah. And then at the very end of the text you selected is verse 25, and it is talks about not remembering the past. He then connects it to himself. God says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, typically, as you mentioned earlier, whenever we're at funerals, people are remembering the deceased. But they often remember, sometimes a little romantically and a little whitewashed, all oh, how wonderful they were and they never could do anything wrong. Uh, but in a way, God, when he looks at us, he sees Christ, right? He blots out our transgressions. Literally, the one who knows all things cannot remember anymore those sins he's forgiven. Exactly. And I think that is why, again, this is such, for me, such a beautiful funeral passage is if I had to stand before the Lord with my laundry list of sins, oh, how horrible that would be. But because of Jesus, those sins are remembered no more. They are taken away. And, and it, it's not about us trying to decide to make things right or hoping that we've had enough good check marks in the good column and that'll be enough to wipe out the the bad check marks in the bad column no it's it's all about jesus and it's all about the work that god has done by giving his son to wipe away our sins pay the debt in full and open the way to life everlasting and you know can't get any better and richer than that now, typically in a funeral, just as in a divine service, we have three readings, well, four. So there are uh, the Old Testament reading, generally a psalm um, or a, um, a, what do we call them, an introit. Uh, then we have an epistle reading and a gospel reading. So for the epistle reading uh, for us to look at today, you have chosen, I'm um, checking my notes real quick. Uh, <laughs> I sort of lost it. Oh, no, here we go. Romans 8. Chapter uh, chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. Let's hear that from the ESV. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us 
from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, you've selected an excellent text here, one of my favorite from scriptures, especially here when we're focusing on God's love. And I think it should be said, not our love for God, from which we are easily separated, but God's love for us. But starting at the top, right? Verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? And uh, the truth is, brother, everybody seems to be against us. So what does that mean? Well, I, you know, I think when we look at this, it's right there from the start. God is for us. And, and I think that's that theme that we'll see carried out in these. God battles for us. God argues our case for us. God gives us his son on our behalf. And, and it comes back already to baptism. You know, we're adopted into God's family through holy baptism. And he sends his son as our redeemer as because we are his children who are dearly loved. You know, one of the things that that I <clears throat> that I love is the the use of the funeral pall, um, not because it's just fancy and shiny and sparkly, um, but really the funeral pall. What is what does it do? It it reminds us of our baptism, that that as the the casket is brought in and the pall placed over it, is the the pall reminds us that that we are now robed in the. Christ's righteousness, that we are connected to Christ in baptism, that that Paul now is the robe of Christ, the, the symbolism of robe of Christ's righteousness that reminds that physical reminder before the people. It's not about a pretty flower spray. Don't get me wrong, flowers are nice, but it's that being now connected again with Jesus, that robed with him, that that who who is uh that God is being for us and that he gave his son for us, that we're connected in baptism to him. And so that everything is all right there for us. And, and it's interesting, Paul starts using um, very much as he does through Romans. And as you've had through the your Roman study, not too long ago, there's very much courtroom talk, you know, who is going to bring charge against the elect? you know, this, this idea of this final judgment, but ultimately it's, well, no one can, because Jesus is the one who, who has died. Jesus is the one who was raised. Jesus is the one at the right hand of God. Jesus is the one who is pleading on our behalf. And, and that again, powerful, powerful words and images for us in a time of great sadness and sorrow. Who can bring charges against us? So, you know, you think of you think of the person laying there and we think, well, you know, I, he was a sinner. Did he do enough? Was he good enough? You know, well, I, you know, I know, you know, you guys are all talking about how great he was. Well, I remember when he was a real jerk and it's like, yeah, you can do that all day long, but none of that matters. Neither the good works of the person nor their sins, because they, as you put so beautifully, are clothed in Christ's righteousness, represented by that beautiful Paul. At our baptisms, we're clothed in white or cloth is given to us to rem to indicate that Christ is what uh, makes this valuable. Even at confirmation, we wear white robes. Uh, pastors, when they represent Christ to the people, wear robes that remove their own humanity. Um, and then, of course, at our death, we're robed again in Christ's righteousness, uh, symbolically anyway, to point to what God has done for us in our baptisms. So, yeah, it's absolutely absolutely beautiful. And and this is a great text. But of course we get this verse 36 for your sake we are being killed all the day long we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. There there is a sense of uh persecution that Christians will go through. And so we find ourselves at the end of our lives and we're freed from those things. And and while death is always law, and while death is never good, and it's not God's intention, and it's in the wages of sin, et cetera, et cetera, there is truth that through death, we come out on the other side having been released from all the troubles, accusations, and, and uh, tribulations and distresses of this world. And no matter what we went through, none of that changed Christ's love for us. I've, I've always heard that as the message that uh that paul is giving here 
Exactly. And and also it 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 points us back even in these verses, it points us back to the suffering servant, you know, in, in Isaiah and and how Jesus was the the Lamb of God who was who innocently was slaughtered on our behalf, whose blood set us free. And and I think that's the thing that again it goes back to the, the Isaiah passage, how does Isaiah passage tie in with the Romans passage when you walk through the waters, when you go through the floods, when you go through the fires? We have those constant calamities around us. We have that persecution around us of, of the, the people who look down upon us because of our faith, the, the, the people who question what we believe, how we believe it, or try to find, oh, you're a Christian, but yet you said a bad word, or you had a bad thought, or you were speeding and beeped your horn at someone in a wrong way, and therefore you can't be that good. You, you know, those kind of things. Um, you know, we have those kind of sufferings around us every day, and the devil assaults us every day. But we aren't just left with suffering and hardship and pain because we are conquerors. We are victors because of what Jesus has done for us. That's right. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that is, of course, his work, his what he did. Well, I know we could keep going for a lot on this particular passage, but I'd like to get in the gospel passage that you selected for today. And this is going to be a very familiar one, probably both to those who have attended funerals or just anybody who has been in the scriptures, which in general, uh, the audience of Thy Strong Word is very scriptural. So they're going to know this as the Good Shepherd passage. This is John chapter 10, uh, and we'll begin with verse 1, and we'll head through verse 15. This is Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers." This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That, of course being Jesus. All right, so why have you selected this one? Well, there there is so much. We probably could have like two radio programs just on this text, but absolutely. For sake of brevity and time. I think again, this is the beautiful passage where um where Jesus is giving us the comfort in there. Now, now interestingly, the he's speaking not just to the people, um, put to the re religious leaders, they're not getting it. So the first, you know, verses one through six, he speaks. Pharisees do not understand at all. So he says it again, you know, verse seven, he's like, hey, guess what? Again, I'm telling you. But you look at, especially in in here where he says, the the sheep know me and they they hear my voice and they follow me. And, and I think, again, there's that beautiful aspect of we are known to the Lord. We are known to the Good Shepherd. And, and the powerful, it, I think what we have to remember, too, is the, the use, Jesus using the two words, I am. We, we think back to Old Testament, you know, who, who says, who is sending me? I am. So that right there 
powerful because that was the name of God. And again, we we recall how the Pharisees, when Jesus uses the I am's and John is the whole I am, you know, all the different I am statements, that they absolutely were going nuts over that. But but here is that promise that in in what Jesus is saying is more than just a carpenter's son speaking. It's the very son of God speaking. That him in the the door, him being the 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 good shepherd is in him there is safety in him there is protection in him there is true pasture and jesus is the only way to get to that it everyone else is there to have that you look at the passage the um where it says that the hired hand is not the shepherd the hired hand uh, does not own the sheep he sees the wolf coming he leaves the sheep and flees but the good shepherd doesn't do that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep and what a beautiful imagery that is to know that that in in all that we face the shepherd is still there and gives his life as the ransom so while the thief steals and the thief stri- tries to destroy now you know here's there's that 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 conversation of this is being pointed towards the Pharisees as the false teachers, as the the thieves who are trying to destroy. But I think we can also look at to see how the devil and his minion does all those things um, to try to destroy us, to pull us away, to cause us to have doubt. But Jesus protects us and gives us that that entrance into that beautiful pasture, the place where uh, the sheep will be able to dwell forever. And we know that as as heaven itself, that he opens the way in there. And sin, death, and the devil are, are powerless against our good shepherd because he has opened that way for us. As you said, we could spend so much time on this passage. I've preached on this a number of times, and it's just rich with great theology and content and hope. Um, You happen to be in luck, uh, uh, listeners at home, because if you're interested in learning more about this particular passage or really anything in the Gospel of John, that just happens to be what my friend, the Reverend Tim Apple, is doing on Sharper Iron. Pastor Apple is is going through the book of John. He's only in chapter 6 right now, so you can tune in to Sharper Iron right here on KFUO. Uh, on weekdays at 8 a.m. So he'll be to this cha- this verse and this chapter very, very soon. And, In our last few minutes, and we just have just a couple minutes, brother, what should the Christian do for their funeral? Like, Give some practical tips that the listeners at home could take to make themselves prepared for when the Lord calls them home. I, I think what, first and foremost, you know, pre-plan, prepare, and, and prepay. Uh, prepay mean just work with a funeral home, it work things out. I know people don't like to talk about it, but you know, talk with your family about your wishes. Tell them what your favorite passage is, what your hymns are, um, why are they meaningful. R- write things down and and talk it over with your pastor. Um, you know, ask that you keep a copy of all your things at the the church office, or if you have a pre need with a funeral home, keep a copy of all your worship stuff that you'd like for the service with the pre need. That you know that way. Um, I've had some funeral uh, directors that they've given me the, a copy of, of what someone had given them of what they want for their service. And again, it, it, it makes my part of my vocation, especially in this time, a, a lot easier. But it also, it, it allows the, the joy of Christ to shine forth. And, and I think ultimately that's the focus of our services. It's, it's not about us. It's not about all the clubs and organizations we did or any awards we have on the wall. It's about Christ and him crucified and the life we live with him. So, you know, I think talk, just talk. It's, it's the more we can to, to pre-plan and, and share and have things laid out. I think the better it is um, because again, it's not a morbid thing for us to look forward to the day when Jesus takes us home, because what a grand and glorious reunion that will be. Amen, brother. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Jim Dobb, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Havelock, North Carolina. Thank you, brother, for being on the show. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. You have a blessed weekend. You too. 
Folks, if you have a special topic you want covered on Free Text First Fridays, let me know by emailing me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook. And don't forget to come back on Monday as Thank we you so much, you as well. Take care. Esther, chapter 7. Uh, until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word. <laughs>